Uh, so thanks everyone for joining us at Vinceri Bio's Weekly Journal Club. This is part of our open science strategy. We've really enjoyed having it. We've had a lot of feedback from other groups that they've enjoyed seeing it as well. Today, we are joined by Dr. A.J. Hinton, who is an assistant professor of molecular biology and biophysics at Vanderbilt University. And I think he shares our love for mitochondria. We're very excited to see some of the work that he's done. Um, I think uh, also he's interested in molecular uh, mechanisms that underlie molecule transfer between and morphological changes in uh, mitochondria and ER, uh, which ties into last week's discussion. So quite timely as well. Um, today, he's going to be telling us about aging and his team's recent manuscript um, in the American Journal of Physiology, which talked about 3D reconstruction of mitochondria in mouse heart tissue um, across normal aging without any additional pathological process. Yes. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Hinton to tell us about the very interesting work. So thank you so very much for the invite. I really appreciate it. Um, today, we're going to get started. I just put my disclosures. I, I have a consultant company, which has kind of sold it, so we don't have it anymore, but I just wanted to be clear. And then I'm on several editorial boards, uh, just to disclose uh, aging cell circulation research, Journal of Physiology, HAP CERT, which the paper I'm presenting, Advanced Bio and Frontiers in Physiology. So I just wanted to give you a walkthrough of kind of the things that we do in the lab and give you kind of some insight behind the work that's been going on and who's doing the work in the laboratory. Obviously, you see me at the top. I'm funded by CZI, Bureau's Welcome Fund, some pilot grants or COI status from NIH, and then also the United Negro College Fund and Bristol Myers Squibb. Um, in my laboratory, today's work will be featured from Zur, um, Edgar. Um, Zur is a senior postdoc in the group. Edgar is a staff scientist. And then also Kit and Larry. Larry is not only a technician, but he's the software engineer behind all the 3D reconstruction. And Kit is the mastermind uh, with helping uh, Zur to be able to get everything done. So um, today I'll be focusing on the MECOS complex and the 3D reconstruction that was done in this particular area and heart aging. And then uh, hopefully if you invite me back, I'll give you a small preview of two other papers where I can kind of go into more detail later about our aging cell paper that was just published and one that we just submitted to a high impact heart failure journal. So in our laboratory, we focus on multiple areas. Um, and as you can see that we've been productive through this year. However, today we'll be talking about the hallmarks of aging and focusing in on mitochondrial dysfunction. So mitochondrial dysfunction is quite um, a area that's very diverse and the way that you could be able to study that. But there's not a lot of area um, that's covered on the 3D reconstruction field and looking at how mitochondrial shape impacts aging and also other particular diseases. So today I'll be talking about two of our funded projects. Um, one in particular, looking at how mitochondria in the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative grant, that's over a million dollars to look at structural changes across aging and also in mouse and human tissues. And then we'll also be talking about the Chris Day Morphology Project as well, looking at the MECOS complex and linking some of that data to the AJP CERC paper, and then also the aging cell paper. And then I just wanted to briefly mention that our long-term goal is to do the entire mouse and the entire human body and looking at 3D reconstruction and looking at mitochondrial profiles and then being able to upload them into a database where we can look at a mitochondrial connectome so that people can be able to visualize these things. So in particular, when you look at mitochondrial dysfunction, you usually use electron microscopy along with other biochemical assays. But one limitation to this is that when you see this transmission electron microscopy image, it's a beautifully well outlaid image of three month, one year, two year uh, mouse hearts, as you can see the transition. And then at the bottom, this uh, slice here is for heart failure from humans, but it doesn't give you the full picture because all you're seeing is a static image. And when you look at static images, you're only looking at one slice, so you're not looking at the entire volume. So if you notice, if you look at the left in this green mitochondria compared to what you see on the EM, this is not representative of what you usually see in the slice because you're only looking at one slice. So when you do 3D reconstruction, you can see that there's a variety of novel shapes that are in place. And it also brings to the question about, well, how should we study this? Why should we, why should we look at these things? Well, as you can see from those dynamic shapes, we all know from the kidney uh, being from that you see in the textbook that mitochondria are the kidney being. However, we need to go and push beyond the textbook and look at the mitochondrial structure. There are now known eight shapes of mitochondria. So this is a representative image that we're putting in a paper right now. 
So just to introduce you, there's the mega mitochondria, which are very large, even as large as the nucleus, small volume and compact mitochondria, which you'll mostly see in the AJP CERC paper, then branching, nanotunnel, donut shape, which actually has holes inside. They're also called ring mitochondria, elongated mitochondria, and large volume mitochondria. So to give you a better understanding, right now we have a lot of different projects going on where we're going over across the entire mouse. So in particular, these are just some highlights. We've published the gastrocnemia, soleus, and cardiac muscle. We've published one cardiac paper that I'm going to introduce today. And then we also have published the gastrocnemia and soleus, which is in the aging cell paper that just recently was out. So I'll give a highlight of that. And then maybe next time you can actually see some of the mitochondrial dysfunction work in the kidney, the liver, or the brown adipose tissue. And we have a novel project right now where we're actually looking at sperm and the entire life cycle of spermatogenesis in 3D. We've also been able to be fortunate enough to start mapping out structural changes in human tissue. As you can see, these are, F, uh, these are MRI images from um, thigh muscle. And then you can see that these biopsies that we're taking, we're doing 3D reconstruction. This is from an aged mouse not an aged mouse, excuse me, an aged human. And you can see that the mitochondria um, are, don't look connected at all, that they've started to fragment drastically with aging. So today I have various projects. I just wanted to introduce the setup. The first project is around the heart muscle of the male. And so that's what we'll focus our majority of our time on. Um, and then we will highlight a little bit about the skeletal muscle and then the human heart. So in the skeletal muscle and the human heart, um, they are just snapshots, so they won't be the full story. And then in the heart muscle, uh, to give you more background, we looked at young, middle, and age mice. So that's three months, one year, and two years in mouse years. And then in young adult, if you will, middle age and elderly and human years. And so we're trying to model these two. So we use 250 mitochondria per sample, and we use N of three. Um, and the reason we use not so many is because of how expensive the technique is, but we survey over using our protocols to be able to establish a standardized method, which we'll talk about. So it's really important to have standardized methods. Um, so we've been fortunate enough to be able to uh, have five papers that standardize some of these uh, techniques and fixation procedures. I'll talk about three because they're more focused on the quantification metrics. But we also do have a paper just to highlight on fixation. So we know that based upon the type of fixation, the way that you treat your mice or the way that you do immersion fixation, it can definitely alter the structure. And so you just want to be aware of those things. And so we got the cover of Advanced Bio explaining those things and using FibSim uh, to be able to highlight the intricate details that could come out of this if you have the right type of fixation. We also have developed a model where we've able to actually look at Criste scoring in 3D. So this is an advanced bio paper where we're describing how mitochondrial structural changes occur in Criste specifically. And we use the brown adipose tissue as a model to do that. And then uh, today we'll be incorporating math and 3D reconstruction from two cells papers that are at the top left. Um, and we published these when we first opened the lab and they've been cited pretty well, one 26 times and one almost 100, I think is around 80 something. And then the, uh, the last one in the bottom here is looking at other organelles. And so that also received the cover. So in particular, to kind of talk about some of these things, um, this these slides have now um, actually been um, updated to be uh, the actual full advanced bio papers because they were accepted. Um, so basically what we're using is ImageJ to do Criste analysis. So you'll see that in the first part of the paper. And we also use ImageJ analysis to be able to look at the mitochondria. Then we proceed to look at um, the different types of mitochondrial characterization using shape description tools. And we also look at Criste morphology as well. And then we use um, uh, an Amira workflow protocol. Not everybody is able to use Python or a MATLAB um, like we are to be able to build structures. So what we decided to do was actually use serial block facing scanning electron microscopy, which is a volume scope, which allows you to fix um, samples in epoxy resin and be able to make slices using a diamond knife. And you take these thousands of images and reconstruct them. And so over in the right, this is the process to do that. So explain how to do that. And then we also talk about the proper fixation and what you can visualize. And using the uh, workflow of the Amira software that doesn't involve Python, we're able to establish a workflow that's user-friendly for everybody to use. And that's the idea, because we want everybody to have access to the software and the workflows that are needed to be able to do this, whether you're using Python or not using Python or MATLAB. 
So just to kind of give you an example of what uh, FibSim is, we're using FibSim, which allows for us to be able to build beautiful models of structures. So this is a, this is a paper from Trends in Biochemical Sciences highlighting the new details that have come out of FibSim. So to give you an idea of what we're doing, we're taking kidney samples, we're isolating them and taking small cuts of one millimeter cubed, we're putting them in a resin, and we're either using diamond knife slices like you saw or fib sim slices, depending on the application of what you see. And we're using the ion source to mill through the image. And then we can use ortho slices, which is what the slices are called, and reconstruct them, as you can see in this red and blue image of a kidney. So today I will be talking about um, specifically this AJP CERC paper, but I wanted to talk about the team and how awesome they are. So the first three papers are all accepted. The advanced bio, it got a cover. The AJP circuit got a cover for the imaging. And we hope that the aging cell paper will get a cover. But if not, it's, it's exciting to have it published. And then I'll now take a small little snapshot at the end to let you know about uh, the heart failure paper that's just submitted. And we are absolutely ecstatic about this particular paper. And one thing to highlight about the AJP CERC paper, um, it is also got considered for the APS Select. So for that particular month, it got picked as one of the best papers. So we were really pleased with that. Um, it lets you know the high quality of science that we're doing with 3D reconstruction and the capabilities of what 3D reconstruction can do for each individual lab. So this is my team. It's always important to talk about, I'm the PI, I might have some ideas and have the money to be able to do these things, but it's really important to be able to thank the individuals that are putting in the hard work to be able to make these projects come to life. So I just want to thank Zara, Edgar, Kit, and Larry for being able to do this. So I wanted to kind of talk about how the Amira software works. I know I've been talking about a bunch of different slices, and there's no visualization of how this works. So earlier you saw the red and blue. So this is from Drosophila muscle. This is just an example. So if you see these slices, we're going slice by slice, and we're going all the way through the block that has been made. And as we go through the block, we're able to characterize them. So as an example, you can see that these are 50 micron deep, 10 by 10 microns, and then there's 300 slices in the samples that we have. So this is really, really a phenomenal way to be able to visualize. You can see organelles very clearly. And because of the grayscaling, we can be able to do some automated work, but mostly we use most automation with FibSim. So red is mitochondria, blue is ER. And as we zoom in, you can see how the mitochondria have been reconstructed and how beautiful these particular structures are. So um, this particular paper was published online um, most recently, and I'm going to start off by talking about just the EM. Obviously, there's a lot of data on here, and I'll break it apart. We're going to talk about male and female modeling of uh, crystal morphology and mitochondrial morphology. So in this particular figure from the paper, we focus on looking at three-month, one-year, and two-year mitochondria. We've taken one millimeter cube cuts, we've sliced them, and surveyed for mitochondria across the heart. And we use that left ventricle and the apex of that heart. And we consistently do that in the same place per mouse. And then per dot, you can see those are individual mitochondria. When we get to the actual uh, 3D reconstruction, there'll be one dot per um, 250 mitochondria. And we'll also have other bar graphs that show the histogram distribution as well. Um, so in this particular setup, you can see that in three month, one year, and two year, we see that there are alterations in mitochondrial structure just by visually looking at this. And you can see that there's a remarkable change in the Christe morphology. So what we did was we decided to quantify this using our image J technique that I previously showed you. So quantifying this with our image J technique, we're able to see that the number of mitochondria is more. So there's more fragmentation with age. And there's also a decrease in the area of the mitochondria, which suggests that they're getting smaller and more fragmented. And then we also normalize this by per area, and we saw the same thing. And then we specifically now also look at circularity index, which is a shape description of how round mitochondria are. So if you can imagine with calculus, you have um, a circle, it fits inside of a square. And so basically it's deciding if it's a polygon or a perfect, uh, perfect circle. The closer to one is a perfect circle. So that's gonna represent fission. The closer it is to zero, it's gonna represent fusion. So you can see that there's a, in, a moderate increase. And so this would suggest that there's more fission going on, which is consistent with the decrease in mitochondrial area and the increase in mitochondrial number. 
And lastly, what we decided to do was Chris Day number and Chris Day score. We were able to find that with Chris Day score, we have alterations in mitochondrial number, uh, not sorry, mitochondrial Chris Day number, excuse me. And then also with Chris Day score, which is a designation between one through four, um, and we we're able to diagnose basically how healthy the mitochondria are when we we're looking at the Chris Day. And we found with three months compared to two years and also one year that there was a decrease in overall mitochondrial Chris Day morphology. So this would suggest that with aging, there's less Chris Day and that the mitochondria are smaller. This samples uh, were also done in female and we recapitulated that this is exactly the same results. So what we decided to do was take a snapshot of the data and look at it in 3D. So here I started with actually showing you the individual distribution and actually setting up the data before I kind of explain it in more detail. So we're going to be using volume to look at the rotation and be able to look at the entire organelle. We'll be looking at surface area and perimeter. They're in 3D as well. And the reason that they're in 3D is because they are specific for looking at overall structural changes. And they're part of the calculation for the actual um, volume scoping. And then when you see data like this, this lets you know this is per mouse and this is the distribution of those individual mitochondria. So now that you're kind of used to this, we'll kind of go in order now. So in the particular paper, we were able to show three month, one year and two year mitochondria reconstructed. And this is the full like figure. We're gonna take it little bit by little bit. So in, if you remember, I introduced individual dots. So these individual dots represent one mitochondria average all the mitochondria average together into one dot and so if you look at this you're able to see that per mitochondria um, set you're able to see that the distribution of mitochondria by volume perimeter and area goes down so this would suggest that they're getting more rounder in the actual context of compact and small mitochondria so then we proceeded to actually use a couple of more calculations to be able to determine whether or not these transverse versus longitudinal mitochondria and this mitotyping was able to characterize mitochondria in more detail. So in D, as you can see here, this explains what uh, MBI is, it's mitochondrial branching index. So this is looking at the transverse distance versus the longitudinal distance. And we use sphericity, which is very similar to mitochondrial complexity index, in case any of y'all know this as people that like mitochondria. And we were able to actually see that there were some changes in sphericity as well. So we're going to take this a little bit in more detail. And I wanted to ask this point, as you're thinking about this, and I'm going to go back and explain this in more detail, but think about what is the mechanism that is causing fragmentation in the aged mouse? So as you can see here, just as a snapshot that you can see that the mitochondria, uh, when you're looking at transverses versus longitudinal, you can see that there's a change in mitochondrial morphology. So we characterize this by looking at the mitotyping and the mitotyping is characterizing uh, mitochondria instead of karyotyping for chromosomes, but this time we're doing for mitochondria. And we basically can see that the karyotyping that there's smaller mitochondria compared to three month and two year and that the mitochondrial branching index is going down with age. And with sphericity, it seems that there is no change in the actual roundness after one year and two year. So then I asked the question earlier about what's causing mitochondrial fragmentation. Well, as you can see from uh, a slice from Edgar's eye, if you will, um, if you can imagine this biopsy or skeletal muscle, you can see that the Chris they are healthy and intact. But remember earlier, I showed you that there are alterations in the Christe structure with age. So this really suggests potentially that there may be a very specific reason to look at the Christe and the Christe proteins. So we asked the question about what mitochondrial proteins are involved in the aging process. And one thing that we pointed back to was looking at Christe morphology. We know that fusion and fission are altered and just to kind of put this in context, fusion is where you have inside a uh, mitochondrial protein that is called OPA1, optic atrophy one, and it fuses with other OPA1s in the inner membrane to actually cause for a larger mitochondria to form. And on the outer membrane, you actually have MFN1 and MFN2 mitofusins helping to do that as well. So with these coordinated fusion events, it's bringing the mitochondria together. 
But if you notice this yellow part, you can actually see this yellow protein that's made up of a complex called the Mikos complex, which I'll explain in more detail in upcoming slides. But Mikos has been solved um, as a way um, to look at Christe morphology. Now, we know OPA1 to be a master regulator of Christe morphology. Um, however, there are now more interesting things that have come out that Christe also can be characterized by looking at these particular proteins called the Mikos complex. So with fission, just to keep in mind, fission has been shown to take the ER and actin and wrap around the mitochondria and separate. And uh, to do this, it's coordinated signaling events while DRP1 binds to one of its four receptors. So this diamond light protein binds to MID49 or 51, MFF or FIS1. So let's just say up under stress conditions, DRP1 is binding to FIS1 and separating. And then TMIM 135 um, is very important because TMIM 135 has been implicated in fission events as well. There's a question. I'm happy to answer it now. How might these mitochondrial changes drive efficiency, change in electron transport chain? So I'll give a hint of this at the end, but just to kind of give you an example, um, there is some changes in OXFOS um, and uh, by what looking at total complexes and then also by Western blot when we're looking at individual complexes and we do see a change in seahorse. So we do see an overall decrease in the Mikos complex in seahorse. We're not the only ones to replicate this. Uh, data, there's some more prominent papers that were in EMBO that recently showed that um, the Mikos complex is linked to Chris Day morphology changes as well. And they also showed some similar findings. Thanks for asking the question. So the Mikos complex um, is very important because it helps ar it architecturally looks at shaping the Christe. And it also affects the Oxfox uh, machinery as well. So there's been a recent paper that shows that MIG-10 has been shown to stabilize uh, the FOF1 synthase or ATP synthase, and it helps to be able to make it more efficient. That was a cell reports paper that recently just came out. And also the Mikos complex itself helps drive efficiency along with the OPA1 protein that interacts with that particular complex. So the Mikos complex is made up of seven members and they're called MIX. So in particular, MIX60, MIX19, and 25 make a complex. And then MIX10, 27, 26, 20, uh, 27, uh, 26, and 12 or slash 13 make a complex. And MIX60 mix and MIX10 kind of help shape everything. Um, and then what's interesting is that MIG-60, um, when it's deleted from the genome, it actually causes for most of the complex to fall apart and decrease in expression. So how is the Mikos involved in aging? Well, the Mikos complex has been shown to interact with OPA1. So let's take these two papers, one in JBC, one in Scientific Reports. And CHCD3, is the same thing as MIC-19 and CHCD6 is the same thing as MIC-25. So they interact with OPA1 and they have been shown to also interact with the outer membrane by looking at the SAM complex, which is a beta barrel set of proteins. So when you have alterations in OPA1 or mucose complex, as you can see from the serial block facing image, the Christe are altered and they look vacuolated. So it begs the question about how is this involved in aging? Well, one thing that we decided to do was look at the transcripts. We looked at the transcripts of OPA1, mitofillin or MIG-60, CHCD3 or MIG-19, and then CHCD6 or MIG-25. And what we saw was that with gene expression by looking at qPCR, there was a decrease in the overall expression when going down towards aging comparing three months to two years. We noticed the most remarkable changes when we looked at mitofillin, OPA1, and then also CHCD6. So we asked the question, could we use transient CRISPRs and then use M-cherry, um, a mito M-cherry tag, to be able to visualize these mitochondria and then reconstruct them um, using stacks? And then when we did the stacks by Confocal, we're able to use the IMERA software to get quantifiable numbers. So I wanted to kind of take this in more detail so that you can see this. So you can see that these particular ones we focused on, there are other members of the Mikos complex. Um, this will be a follow-up paper where we're looking more at the other components, but they do have an effect. But for this particular paper, we just focused on mitofillin, CHGD3, and CHGD6, just in case you're wondering. So when we did this, we also took some videos so that you can kind of see the dynamics. 
So some of the dynamics in the wild type is much faster than what you can see in the knockouts. And you can see that they're, they're much smaller um, as far as the fragmentation is concerned. So we quantify this um, and I'll show you this on the next slide. But before I do, I just wanted to show you the messenger RNA knockdowns of the mitophilin, the CHCD3 and CHCD6, which we're using as experimentals uh, compared to the control. But we're also looking at OPA1 as a positive control because we know that when you knock out OPA1, it alters mitochondrial structure. So when we did this, we were able to establish in these mitochondrial uh, samples that there were alterations in these structures. And so we noticed this specifically in mouse fibroblast cells. So when we did this, we looked at length and volume and we saw a drastic decrease in mitochondrial length and volume in all groups. And then we also looked at the percentage of whole mitochondria that would be fragmented versus tubular. And we saw that the ratio was mostly mitochondria that were tubular or networked in the wild type compared to fragmented. But with the variations you can see in the white that there's variations in fragmentation compared to the tubular ratio. So to get at the question that was asked um, originally, we looked at seahorse. So I know you can't tell very much by looking at this, but I'm just gonna introduce seahorse to you. Seahorse is a way to look at oxygen consumption rate and you normalize this by protein or cells. And in our particular case, we did protein per well. And um, what's interesting about OCAR, there is also ECAR, but we don't show the ECAR data in this particular paper. We just show OCAR data um, because we all put some of that in a follow-up paper. But in particular, when we knocked out OPA1, mitophilin, CHCD3, and CHCD6 by transient CRISPR, we saw a reduction. And so I'll explain that in a more details. So when we're looking at this, we have to be able to visualize this. So one, two, three, and four are linked as basal. Five, six, seven are the oligomycin-induced uh, step where oligomycin is blocking ATP synthesis. So it's called the ATP-linked oxygen consumption. And then 8, 9, and 10 are FCCP or CCP, where you're pushing all the protons across the gradient and you get the maximum burst. And then 11, 12, and 13 are blocking complex 1 and 3. So antimycin A is uh, 3, and then rotenone is complex 1. And so when you see this, you can look at basal, ATP linked, maximal capacity, and spare capacity, and can see that compared to the control, all of the different knockouts have a various effect on oxygen consumption in each step. But one thing to point out is that OPA1 has the most dramatic change compared to the control, but I find that CHCD6 in purple compared to the control is also a still a good robust finding. Um, and it makes sense that um, there may be some redundancy between CHCD3 and CHCD6 because they're very similar, um, but mitophilin also seems to have a various effect. So it seems like that maybe because there's some compensation with some of the other members that their protein still low level, that maybe there's not as much of a decrease. So I know you're all thinking, well, okay, well, this is not done in cardiomyocytes. Oh, let me see this other question. Ah, yes. So great question. So um, the question is referring to if we knock down the Mikos complex, do we see upregulation of the other components? Uh, but the complex in our hands, in the skeletal muscle, the cardiomyocytes, and the fibroblasts, we do not. One thing that has been shown in the literature is that you can rescue this effect by adding back OPA1 and overexpressing OPA1. Um, so that was done in some Alzheimer studies. Um, and then we also plan to actually see if we can reverse this effect using an AAV that we're designing. But we're using an ER-targeted stress protein that we've known that can regulate mitochondrial morphology. And the reason we're doing that is because uh, in an EMBO paper that was published from the Dell Able group, which I came from, Hanada Pereira showed that when you lose OPA1, you see alterations in ER stress and also mitochondrial morphology changes. And so with that, there was upregulation of ER stress. So we're using ER stress as a target to actually reverse this particular phenotype related to mitochondrial structural changes. And in a paper that's in revision at Journal of Cell Physiology that I did um, when I was in Dell's lab, we are able to kind of show some of this uh, effects by fixing some of the mitochondrial morphology and ER context by overexpressing this particular protein. 
So let's get back to this particular set of presentation, but great question. We looked at knocking out CHCD6, uh, which is uh, MIG-25, and we saw that there was alterations in heart morphology. Um, and so it's really cool because in these uh, IPS cardiomyocytes, we can see that there's fragmentation of the mitochondria and there's organizational changes in the way that the fibers are set up. So this begs the question that CHCD6 may be extremely important for organization of the fibers. There's another question. So there is, um, so there's, I think uh, there's a little bit of confusion, so I want to clarify. So when you're measuring CRISTE for EM uh, or CRISTE for 3D EM, the 3D EM, we use the paper that's in advanced bio that uses CRISTE score. And then for TM, there's four main calculations. There's CRISTE volume, there's CRISTE area, CRISTE, and it's CRISTE surface area to be exact, CRISTE number, and then also CRISTE score. Christe score was developed by the Yuri Hanowski um, and Amy Vincent, no, uh, Yuri Hanowski, excuse me, and Veronica Eisner that was published in a PNS paper where they designated zero through four to be able to actually look at the individual Christe. And when they did this, uh, they were able to score based upon how much percentage of the Christe were there. So that's for EM related things. And then for the context for the measure, the number of Christe, by looking at Christe complex one through five, that's separate. So Seahorse measures overall oxygen consumption. So we couldn't look at individual Christe with the question that I'm asking. I'm just asking generally, if you lose this particular gene from the complex, does this alter oxygen consumption with the Seahorse assay? To get at the question that you're asking, it would actually, let's take OPA1 for an example. There are different isoforms of OPA1. And there's a paper that has been able to demonstrate that per isoform, there's different functions. And one of those isoforms is like E, I believe from that particular paper, that you can be able to see that uh, it's particularly important for uh, restoring some of the Christe and respiration effect. So for Christe morphology, we have not learned enough about the individual domains, such as the CHCHD domain, that uh, comes from the uh, MIG-19 or MIG-25 and look at the basic key loop, loop structure to be able to determine if a certain part of that is functional for the Christe morphology versus another. Um, there are also other experiments where you could knock out GTPA's activity if we were specifically talking about OPA1 or DRP1, and those have been shown to be important for Christe architecture. And that was a paper that was published in Ruth, a Ruth Slack's group that was an EMBO. Uh, and David Patton, I believe, was the first author where he looked at Christe morphology up under starvation conditions and autophagy and how that played a role in shaping the Christe and what part of the domain of that particular protein, OPA1, was important. So I hope that helps. And hopefully I answered the question the best that I could. And if you have more follow-up questions, I'm happy for you to answer. Now, one thing that we also did was we wanted to understand if there were membrane potential changes based upon the loss of CHCD6 or MIG-25 and also look at oxidative stress. So in our IPS cardiomyocytes, we stand for TMRE, DCFDA, and then Hoish, and we overlaid them. And so what we can find is that in the cardiomyocytes, there's a slight decrease in membrane potential. There's a huge increase in oxidative capacity. Um, not, sorry, not oxidative capacity, but oxidative stress, excuse me. So we did this with DCFDA and we follow this up using mitosox just to confirm. And just to show you that the um, mitosox, you can see the staining and you can also see troponin, which lets you know that these are actual cardiomyocytes. So that is the end of that particular paper. And um, as we start to close, because I know I have to have time for questions, I just wanted to tell you that now this paper was on bioarchives, but now it's in press and aging cell. So I want you to kind of uh, actually look at this paper in more detail, but I'm happy to kind of come back and talk about more. But in this particular paper, we actually demonstrate that CHCD6, along with the rest of the mucose complex, is important for alterations in, in structure at the Christe level, but also at mitochondrial morphology level and gastronemius and soleus. And they actually saw our cardiac paper, so they actually asked us to actually make uh, new slices and do 3D reconstruction and compare the cardiac to the soleus and the gastronemius. And so one of the remarkable findings from this paper is that is the mitotyping, that the Christe architecture structure is completely altered and it's drastically changed between the gastronemius and the soleus. 
and then also in the um the cardiac it's completely changed as well um and what we find is that in the three month compared to the two year that there's a decrease in overall morphology and that um the morphology changes that occur um are showing spanning some of the very unique shapes that i talked about at the very beginning and we're able to mark this by the mitochondrial complexity index and then also by its sphericity there's a question in the chat so yes, there are um, many human diseases that are linked to the mycos complex. For example, if you type in Quill one plus uh, eLife, um, you'll come or or Mic thirteen, you'll find a paper that's associated with the mycos complex and disease. There is a paper that Jody Narni's group did, and um, she demonstrated. Um, I forgot what year it was. But there was a paper that was a review that was so well done. It actually pull together the current literature around what diseases that were associated with the mycos complex. So there was uh, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, and there's also um, a couple other diseases as well. I think cancer was also mentioned in Alzheimer's. Um, more recently, there was a paper that shows that um, the mycos complex is linked to alterations in um, ER mitocontact communication and that was, I think, done with mix 60 and that was in an Alzheimer's case. So there's plenty of diseases out there that are associated, but it's still understudied. Um, and I will also answer your question around mix 60 as well in more detail. So in the aging cell paper, we link Christe morphology to changes in cardiolipin and other lipids. And we were able to show that um, there was changes in skeletal muscle, as you can see here at E. Um, and then that we saw changes in mitochondrial length and volume. And we did show changes in, in the skeletal and the cardiac. But one thing I wanted to show you is that there's also changes in the liver and then also in the kidney tissue as well. So just something for you to think about. And then now just to answer your question about if it's linked to disease. Well, the heart failure paper that I kind of highlighted at the end. So in normal heart failure conditions, um, you know, you have a normal heart. You can see the other structure. You can see mitochondrial dynamics changes that happen normally. And there's efficiency in the electron transport chain and production of ATP. However, in a failing heart, you can see that there's dysfunction because the fibers are altered, similar to what I showed you in the IPS cardiomyocytes, impaired dynamics, inefficient electron transport chain, and decrease in ATP. So could this be a response to changes in mitochondrial morphology? So what we did was we use this incredible database that's called BioView, where we're able to model GTEx data um, from, from almost every tissue. There's not every tissue there. And about 838 donors, or less than 1,000, and they were done RNA-seq on those particular individuals in those tissues. And then we use predicted gene expression called GTEx um, and GREG, and we're able to be able to look at uh, genotyping data and look at how these associate with certain diseases. So in BioView, we're able to establish that from the 85,615 patients, we wanted to know if these were any cases based upon ethnicity that were associated with heart failure status. So what we were able to find was that in the uh, CHC6 uh, GREX, uh, there was an association with heart failure. And what was interesting is that this was nominal significance. It didn't pass Bonferroni, but especially in MIC-25, the fascinating thing is that it affected Europeans, but also African-Americans. And we're underpowered for African-Americans in our database. Majority of our patients are from European reported ancestry. So in CHCD6 in the heart atria and aorta, we can see that there was a decrease in overall significance, which would suggest that there is a over uh, there is a statistical significance in the European populations in those tissues in the heart. But also, the, what's interesting is the odd ratio. So this is going to get a little bit at the overexpression question. So in Europeans, it seems that the odd ratio is associated with SNPs that are higher expressed, but in the uh, CHCD6 samples from the left ventricle of the heart and African Americans, it's statistically significant and it's associated with a decrease in all of the SNPs. So this brings to the question about could we model this effect? So what we did was we looked for samples that had passed away of car, car accident cases, and then we compared them to heart failure samples. 
So we're collaborating with Peter um, and then also Brian Glancy. Peter's from Brian's Lab and then also Olu, um, who's from UCLA. And um, Zer and Peter are co-first on this particular paper that was just submitted. And what we did was we modeled uh, 3D reconstruction of failing hearts. So in this particular setup, we look at volume changes and we find that in the heart failure cases, which was a surprise to me, as that they're larger in volume um, across the four cases that we looked at um, compared to the controls, which was uh, pretty remarkable for us and it was unexpected. But one thing that you can see is that in the control hearts, you can see that the fibers are intact um, and that you can see the mitochondria pretty well and there are some lipid droplets. But in the heart failure, you can see that the fibers are separated and that the mitochondria have autophagosomes and other artifacts in them. And then we did mitotyping and we found that the sphericity was uh, decreased. So it suggests that these mitochondria are more fused as you can clearly see that these mitochondria are more larger um, compared to the controls. And just another quick snapshot of the paper uh, before I end and, and answer more questions is that we also rearranged the fibers because remember I told you in the CHCD6 knockout, the fibers were altered. So there'll be a future paper looking more at the fiber alterations, but that IPS cardiomyocyte data is actually in the AJP CERC paper. Um, and there is also one other group um, that actually has published an ELIF paper similar to the AJP CERC paper and also the aging cell paper around um, how the mitochondria look in the heart and how CHCD6 is altering that. So this is actually really nice to be able to see that around the same time that we're publishing the same uh, consistent data. So in the heart failure case, we can see that just by the image, I don't wanna get too much into the data because this paper is not fully out, is that um, you can see that there's expansion um, and how the organization of the fibers look. So it suggests that with heart failure, there's reorganization and, the, and there's expansion of these fibers. So it, it begs the question about, could we use the Mikos complex as a way to deliver gene therapy to actually rearrange some of these heart failure if we gave them to mice? So on the left is the control where you can see the fibers are nice, nicely organized. And then you can see that there's some alterations in how they spanned in the heart failure case. And yes, these are two different uh, magnifications it's just to show you the details of the alterations in the fibers. So we did a quick snapshot of control and disease, if you will, the two groups. And we can clearly see that from the metabolome and lipidomics that there are huge changes. So I'm just showing the metabolome. And so we can see that there's a change in NAD. There are individuals out there that would suggest that NAD is very important in the context in preventing aging. So that is a particular group that we collaborate with, Melanie McReynolds, Dr. Melanie McReynolds at Penn State. She has shown uh, countless times in a lot of her papers that, that span nature, cell, and um, one of her most recent ones in cell uh, systems that shows changes in NAD metabolism. And so this is really good to kind of see that NAD metabolism is linked to aging. And so since these are from age individuals that we see that, that there's a huge change this would suggest that, you know, we've, we've correctly done these metabol this metabolomics. We also see changes in amino acids. Um, so this is also something that has been reported before. So it's nice to see that these hearts are <coughs> truly failing. So in conclusion, we've shown that with GTEx and GREX uh, shows CHCD6 association with heart failure and European and African-American ancestry, which is really wild since our database is underpowered for African-American and uh, African ancestry. We've shown that there's unique shapes. I also wanted to comment that there is also changes not only in IMF, which is what I showed you, but also subsarcoloma and perinuclear. <laughs> but I don't show that data for lack of time. And then we also have knocked out both CHCD3 and CHCD6, and it shows mitochondrial fragmentation in the fibroblasts, the IPS cardiomyocytes, and also the skeletal muscle samples, which I didn't show you in great detail from the aging cell paper. And then we also have seen changes in um, IPS cardiomyocytes specifically um, from CHCD6 and shows changes in oxidative stress and a partial decrease in membrane potential from the acids that you saw with DCFDA and then the mitosox staining, and then the TMRE. So I just want to thank some of my lab, um, which we've already kind of shown you at the beginning, but this is some of the summer students that we take um, over the last uh, summer, and they did a fabulous job in helping us to be able to put uh, together these papers and the data. And I also, will, of course, thank my funding, 
especially the CZI and Bureau's Welcome Fund. Um, they have really helped me to be able to champion these causes around 3D reconstruction. And then lastly, uh, my career development grants that started my lab, uh, which was the United Negro College Fund, Bristol Myers Squibb Faculty Fund for E Just Fellows. And then also my supplement that gave me a second uh, E Just Fellow to fund my postdoc. So with that, I'll take questions and thank you so very much for your time. Wonderful. Thank you so much for this very interesting and jam-packed uh, data session. Uh, th thanks for sharing some of the unpublished data with us as well. It's always exciting to see that on top of some of the um, published work. I do see a couple of more questions that have come in, and also I got a couple of questions that were sent to me directly. And I have one of my own that I may selfishly just ask you since time is uh, relatively uh, restricted here, which is around um, translation. So we're a very translational group, as you might expect. So I know you've, um, and you mentioned a few of them there at the end with, you know, NAD, uh, which, which would, you know, obviously NAD plus supplementation, you know, NR or NMN. Um, you also mentioned Miko's gene therapy, possibly. There are um, other things out there, for example, mitochondrial biogenesis. We're working on mitophagy enhancers. Uh, there are a lot of you know, a lot of different things. What are your thoughts on the translational side of this? And also have you done alongside with that, have you done anything in the in the lab that actually like reverses the aged phenotype back into the young phenotype? So that's a great question. So uh, so uh, to tell you from other people and then I'll tell you about us, uh, there's a cell metabolism paper that just came out that did gene therapy with, um, I think it was MIC-19 and they saw some changes in the liver. So they're using this adenovirus system, which I think is really phenomenal um, to be able to kind of deliver like some overexpression phenotypes uh, that would hopefully induce changes in metabolism. One of the things that we actually have going on with the group at Stanford is looking at mitochondrial transplantation and looking at that if it can reverse the structural changes in um, and aging. Um, and so that's one thing we're looking at. The other thing that we're looking at is uh, NAD supplement with uh, the Penn State group, uh, Dr. Melanie Reynolds. Um, and so I, I don't want to mention too much on that one. And then we also are looking at um, how um, if we reverse heart failure with either OPA1 or CHCD6 uh, adenovirus therapy, could we you know, see these changes? And we do have an adenovirus that's developed for a particular set of ER stress markers that we're starting to deliver in mice to determine if that can alter the structure besides directly looking at the mycos complex or OPA1. So we are exploring some of those uh, currently right now. Um, and so that was a really great question. Um, and then the questions in the chat, that is correct. The odds ratio is di very different. Uh, for Europeans versus African Americans. So now it begs the question about is ethnicity important? So in my CZI grant, we're actually the second aim because we're almost done with the first aim where we're going across the entire mouse and the human body just looking at general aging. But the second aim is to look at ethnicity. And so we're actually now powered enough because Vanderbilt has a collection of like 1800 hearts. Um, and so we're powered enough to actually start looking at ethnicity. So we'll be doing that relatively soon. So expect the impact of some of the papers to increase because we'll be doing nothing but human. Uh, so stay tuned for some of those particular papers. And some of those are really rare cases, individually looking at hearts and then versus looking at larger group studies and, and hearts, looking at metabolism or lipidomics. And then fascinating talk. Oh, thank you. Did you mention at least eight different mitochondrial shapes? Uh-huh. Did you notice a specific sub? Mm, yes, I left that out on purpose. And then there's some <laughs> of the mitochondrial types. Ah, uh -huh. see, I left that out on purpose. So there is two reviews that we're doing right now. One that is under revision um, at a cell press paper. And uh, we talk about the different shapes and our thoughts around diagnostics about how certain types of individual shapes may be linked to certain types of aging or other heart failure cases. And then I'm writing another uh, editorial for AHA Journal around uh, this as well. So we'll actually make some implications around with maybe <laughs> which shapes that we see uh, that may be more pathological associated. So we'll take a leap of faith in the perspective area to, to talk about that.